I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. I always find it interesting about Ross Browning that at the point in time he sort of tried to go straight and separate himself from the Kinnahan cartel. He was also sitting on this sort of wealth and had businesses and stuff like that, which clearly the Criminal Assets Bureau case has proved he had because of the proceeds of crime. So it wasn't really, he wasn't really fully cutting the cord, was he? No, and he probably wasn't. And uh, it obviously is a hard court to cut, you know, I'm mm. watching The Sopranos and at the moment, You're as I said that. again, yeah, and they can still myself. keep saying they, you know, the quoting the the Godfather line. They yeah. just when I tra- thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Um, the line from Godfather Tree, I think. So, I mean, Ross Browning, I think maybe because it was around sort of twenty sixteen, seventeen that you started hearing, oh, he was, you know, he turned his back on it, he'd gone all religious, gone very zen, very healthy, wanted to have nothing more to do with organised crime. And I mean, obviously that was at a time when the Kinnahan mob were at the height of their violence. Yeah, I think it might have even been slightly before that. Because yeah. at that stage, before pre-feud, you seem to have built, made a good bit of money. Didn't seem was on the Garda radar for sure, but there was no cab cases. Mm-hmm. He had a number of legitimate businesses and maybe felt he was in his, you know, he'd been involved with the the upper echelons of the Kinning cartel since he was a teenager, maybe felt now was the time to get out while he was ahead. And we had always heard that there had been uh, an incident of violence um, that had led to this tragedy that Ross Brown, uh, that a man had you know, suffered gravely from, say, an incident of violence that Ross Browning had felt very bad about. He'd witnessed something that he wasn't able to really, supposedly, as the story went, that he wasn't able to come to terms with. Yeah, that, that you know, that, that something had happened that was maybe unplanned, but there'd been, uh, had, had gone dramatically wrong. And at this stage, obviously, he was running uh, kind of vegan type businesses and um, he was certainly all into fitness himself um, and maybe had seen a path out. But I think the feud, uh, as the feud kicked off and intensified, uh, from what we hear, Daniel Kinnan was even people like Freddie Thompson, who had been kind of edged out, were all pulled back in. And he was relying on the people he knew, people he could trust. Mm-hmm. All of that became at a premium. And Ross Browning's uh, long-term ties uh, he wasn't allowed to walk away. Yeah. Now, the Criminal Assets Bureau case, and it sort of culminated this week when uh, the Criminal Assets Bureau officers made their way onto the lands out in Garristown, which is in sort of Mead. Yeah. yeah. And um, they sort of took control of those lands. Now, that was where Ross Browning was living in a house along with his partner, Um they had developed a paddocks and a sort of a show jumping arena thing on the land. Uh, his mother, Julie Conway, was living with her partner, Dave O'Brien, a former Garda. We'll get to that. Uh, in a, in what was the sort of the lodge, Chestnut Lodge, it was called. Uh, the Criminal Assets Bureau case had also, also identified lands out near Rush and they had identified a house in Finglas and all of which was... Um, went unchallenged, actually. It was respondents as opposed to Ross Browning himself, the target of the Criminal Assets Bureau, that challenged it. Um, the Criminal Assets Bureau were given, basically, the go-ahead to take those lands. Some of the money from the sale of Chestnut Lodge will go back to Julie Conway and to Dave O'Brien, who proved to the court that, that the, the money that they had kind of put into the renovations of it was their own, including a, a bank loan. Sorry, a credit union known from St. Raphael's Credit Union, which yes. is the Garda Credit Union. Yeah. You couldn't write it. No. Um, but that's what happened this week. And um, Ross Browning, we don't know where he is, whether he's in the country or out. We haven't heard much of him. But I suppose to get to there, we have to start at the beginning with Browning. And he grew up in Hardwick Street Flats, which was the heartland of that um 
anti-drugs, you know, yeah. the, the the parents against drugs movement, concerned parents against drugs movement. I think it was really one of the places where it kind of was born. And that would have been when he was growing up. That would have been when he was growing up. And it certainly, it was born around there. And in part because... Uh, some of the, the the Dunn brothers' operation was based in there and people had, heroin had been sold out of Hardwick Street flats. As everybody knows, the, it caused a, an absolute epidemic really, really quickly. Hardwick Street flats was one of the places it was very, very visible. And um, the Parents Against Drugs movement and, and other associated movements uh, grew very strong there very quickly. He would have grown up around it. Um, His but, father, actually, Kieran Browning, was one of the noted members of that anti-drugs movement. Yeah, he, he, was, um, he was a leading figure in yeah. it. Um, and, of course, that was all happening in, in the, 19, the 1980s. Um, so, but, of course, as well as the anti-drugs movement being born up there, um, it, it also housed people that would go on to play very leading roles in the biggest ever cartel uh that that ever grew out of this state as well, um, not necessarily just in Harwick Street flats, but in the general area. So Ross Browning would, when he was a teenager, would have been friends with a number of key people that that were still being spoken about mm. today. Um, one of them in particular would have been Gary Hutch, who while was living in the general area. Um, another would have been Gary Finnegan, who remains extremely close to Daniel Kinnahan, uh, is probably one of the few people that that has stayed absolutely loyal and absolutely central to him. Um, and also uh, uh, Barry Finnegan, Gary Finnegan's cousin. So these were all grown up in that general area. And, you know, they would have first come to the attention of the Gardaí as teenagers. Uh, in particular, they were involved in a, an armed robbery together. Isn't it ironic to think that Hardwick Street Flats as an area like that it, that those two extremes kind of happened within one generation? Yeah. You know, the parents of these guys were out fighting the scourge of heroin, believing that by marching on homes and by campaigning that they could actually stop this, you know, tsunami, which was kind of hitting those communities. They believed that their protests were going to make a difference. When you look back on a lot of the footage from that, you can just see how much they believe. Yeah, they believe I mean... It. They don't have a clue what they're fighting against. I mean, hindsight is a great thing, but nobody knew how drugs was going to absolutely take hold and become part of the fabric of society back then, you know? Yeah, I mean, if you look, at, ironically, I mean, of course, the, the Kinnan cartel made a lot of their money selling to the middle classes of Ireland, you know, that's the reality. Mm. I mean, Hardwick Street Flats was in in the actual area itself, the actual uh, complex was cleaned up by the Parents Against Drugs. But what happened was they just pushed some of the drug uh, uh, addicts out of, and the drug dealers out of the actual flats and into maybe uh, rented properties around Dublin city mm. centre. Of course, it couldn't solve the problem. Yeah, you know, and of course they just came back as they, they, as they do always. But you know, then a new generation of of people grew up involved in the drugs trade, and they were, um, you know, Ross Browning would have been part of that wave of people, uh, you know, selling ecstasy in 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 clubs in Dublin city mm -hmm. centre, and. Look, the reality is people viewed that differently in that community. Um, they made a very clear distinction between heroin and, and those mm -hmm. kind of, uh, you know, recreational drugs, for want of a better term, or designer drugs, whatever term you want to use. Um, but yeah, it's, it is an, it's an incredible uh, sort of story, I suppose. Mm, you know? Of a place, you know, sometimes these streets around Dublin, I think in particular, tell such a story. I actually... Only there recently went to Henrietta Street to look at that house, you yeah. know, the, 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 the tenement museum, house. Have you yeah. been? It's Not really fantastic. Been. You should bring the kids. Really interesting. Yeah. But I mean, it tells how this house, this street, you know, tells the story of the aristocracy in the 1700s, these fabulously wealthy, um, you know, Brits that came over to live, the Anglo-Irish and they yeah. settled. They, that was their townhouse, yeah. Henrietta Street. And then, of course, um, after the revolution, the end of 1700s, they went back to the UK for their parliament to stop coming to Dublin. So the house became divided up and rented out. Yeah. And obviously then it became a tenement. Yeah, slum, of and, and the last resident lived in it up until 19... Uh, 
1989 or either 79 or 89, I think 79 actually, the last residents moved out and uh, I mean, it was just, there was a hundred people living yeah, there. Yeah, but I mean, this, toilets. Unbelievable this is how the city keeps changing. Like mm. I um, remember driving around Hardwick Street flats with my, with my dad when I was, you know, in around the same age as Ross Browning. And I remember seeing these new apartment blocks growing up in that general area, you yeah, know, like, yeah. as they are in the north inner city. Mm-hmm. And I remember my dad saying, who is going to pay a hundred thousand to live there when yeah. this is opposite. But of course the city is keeps changing now and, and the inner city is changed now. There's mm-hmm. rented accommodation all up around that part that within living memory was the scene of a drugs epidemic. Mm. Uh, it just keeps changing for sure. Totally. And Ross Browning, you know, he would have obviously being a teenager involved in these and you have to wonder like he always had a funny reputation uh in that area because people would say oh he's a real nice guy and oh he's a gentleman i think we used to hear didn't we that that actual term that ross browning was um you know he was a bit different than the other Mm -hmm. the other guys and you know but obviously you can see um that whatever way he was as a person or in his manner um I mean, that's a huge amount of wealth for the state to get their hands on. Sure I think it added up this week to something like, I heard two different estimates, but something like one and a half million pounds yeah. worth of assets that could be proved, that were proven in court to be fully or partially uh, bought with the proceeds of crime. I mean, that's, that's an extraordinary thing for somebody of his generation to do here yeah. in this country. But of course, we'll go on to it, but he did try and hide it. Yeah. his own wealth within his his large extended family by putting properties and, and businesses in their names. Now, his mother and father split up when he was quite young and he went to live with the mother, Julie um, Conway. She went back to her, her uh, maiden name and they were obviously a very close family. He became friendly with, as you said, the Finnegans and Gary Hutch and later with, uh, he became a personal friend of Daniel Kinahan's. And he sort of took on a role. A lot of those names that we know from the cartel, they would have led cell groups as as uh, was the structure of the Kinahan organized crime group. And the reason was they had cell structures. So as each cell was operating, presumably looking after a particular area of Dublin sales area and with, you know, middlemen and lower down dealers. But the each cell had no idea what the other cell was doing in a typical sort of old military fashion that if one cell was busted, broken down, brought in, that they wouldn't actually have the information on who else was running yeah. what other cells. So it kind of, you know, um, it, it diluted the effects that yeah, I mean, made their was, way back up to the Kinahans. I mean, it was largely pockets. modelled on the IRA, actually, the, mm. the provisional IRA, who really put that cell structure in place that if if any one cell was, was, was you know, either infiltrated or else was caught by the police, it didn't mean the whole organisation collapsed. Um, Ross Browning certainly had a huge uh, influence over the drugs trade in, in Finglas in particular yeah. and seems to have had a good lot of involvement in Limerick as well. Mm -hmm. For sure, because didn't we stumble upon some homes that he had down in Hyde Road in Limerick, which were trees growing up the middle of them. I visited them. You couldn't even get in the front door. But they uh, had obviously been given to him as a debt from the Dundon organisation for some drugs. But anyway, I suppose moving on, he, Browning was, became very, very embedded within the Kinahan organisation. And all the while, amassing this fortune. Um, But at the same time, he was a fitness fanatic and he was kind of into this particular lifestyle. Um, He and members of his family at one point went on an RTE show called uh, Fittest Family. Family. And they had actually filmed quite a bit of this before they realised who yeah. he was. And he had convictions, of course, at this point to do with passport fraud. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure, no doubt, there's rules in place about, you know, if you have... Well, I mean, yeah, I'm not fully sure. Had he actually got been done for passport fraud at that stage? I think it was that he was able to say I had little or no convictions. Um, but it became obvious. Now, I could be wrong, actually. Yeah. But at this point, anyway, either way, whether... Whatever convictions he had, there was also, at the point at which he was filming, 
there was also a well-publicized extradition warrant uh, for Frat Freddy Thompson when he was being extradited to Spain, where Ross Browning's name was all over it, yeah. uh, describing his role in the cartel, describing collecting people, dropping people off. Um, so it was, whether he had convictions or not, or he, uh, he certainly I had. I think they had to scrap some of the uh, the show oh, and, yeah. and very quickly find another family to compete. Um but at the meantime, he set up a, he had set up at this stage a um, company called I Living, which was like a gym. And then it was kind of like this lifestyle thing, really. It was it was exercise classes plus vegan eating. And he had studied um, the teachings of a guy called Robert, Dr. Robert O. Young from the States, who was sort of a controversial guru um, who was into this super healthy kind of almost, uh, you know, you, you know, these diets that I yeah. think that neither you nor I am oh, no, going to speak no, for you as well no, no. have been on, but that you you end up really that you're probably not taking in. Yeah, just no, in no, it. well, no processed food of all at all, I Whatsoever, think, was it? Yeah. yeah. Which is probably good for you. Right. But anyway, yeah. he did study this and he sort of had this, what people who would have been close to him would have described as this road to Damascus moment that he wanted to live this lifestyle and he wanted to create a community of people who he could pass on this knowledge. Now, he he ended up, there was photographs posted by members of his family of him on social media to kind of to advertise this eye living and the gym. And he was like, I mean, yeah, no, uh, no fat in his body. No fat that whatsoever yeah, yeah. and built up and looking yeah. like something on Love Island. Yeah. Um, and then he had grown this beard and kind of long, dark hair. And actually, they're all quite good looking, that family. They're yeah. quite striking looking. Um, and obviously had bought this, these properties, this this big site out in Garristown, which was almost becoming a compound and was developing it. But all the while, everything that he had or had created from the proceeds of crime, he was putting it into relatives, aunts, and relatives of his mother, a lot of the her extended Conway family were involved. We heard during the criminal assets bureau cases that um, a number of the the Conway uh, family were were kind of um, seen as the owners of this and yeah. of the properties, including his grandfather. Yeah, because the grandfather's uh, will was brought into the the criminal assets bureau case. But yeah, so there was a disconnect with him. I always felt that while. This road to Damascus, this healthy living, this, you know, this whole veganism, which it definitely was very far apart from the drugs uh, game, the business yeah, of drugs and all putting all those chemicals into your body and um, the fit, the healthy living, the kind of aim to create that nirvana lifestyle for other people was at such odds to the fact that it was all tied to drug money. I yeah. mean, everything he had, his 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 home, uh, what he had sort of created for the inner circle of that family was only there from drugs money. Yeah. And I mean, even within the, the I living uh, training center, like although he's preaching this healthy lifestyle, there was still other people there training with him. Like, for example, Eamon Cumberton, there was loads of pictures of him at at I living, Eamon Cumberton would go on to, to he's serving life for uh, uh, a feud murder. The murder of Michael Barr. Murder of Michael Barr. Yeah. Um, and Cumberton was introduced to the Kinnahan organization by Browning. Yeah. He would have been his friend and the Kinnahan organization in the immediate aftermath of February 2016 went out looking for hit teams. So that's he, what jobs they had for offer. And then obviously as well at that time in particular, Ross Browning was very much engaged with, with uh, a criminal who had become known as Mr. Flashy. Of course, uh, Mr. Flashy is, is uh, you know, still in the papers regularly uh, to do with, a, a, you know, a long running violent dispute in Finglas. So he was straddling both sides of the fence for sure mm. um, appearing on RTE's Fitness Family giving testimonials on websites about healthy living, but also being associated with these people who are doing the opposite, but healthy living really, you know. Mm. Strange one. I mean, we often ran headlines when we were writing about him as being the cartel oddbot. Yeah. And he for sure was that. Yeah. I mean, even people that know him and within that sort of drugs underworld say he is 
quite odd. Like, yeah, it's yeah. just it's slightly different. And I wonder how difficult it was to get out for him. Um, mm. I wonder, uh, you know, obviously he had made a lot of money. You know what? What people? What the the criminal assets bureau? They, they can take visible wealth. There must have been other money as well, um, uh, certain extravagant spending that was going on as well. Uh, you know, so I wonder, which we did hear at one point that that it was when that feud happened that there was no option but you're coming back in and you're coming back in. I had heard he was absolutely ordered. Yeah. Like, you know, there was no question of it. No. He was back in. It was all hands on deck. And then the really, the first time we were hearing about him, very, actually, initially when the, the feud was was kicked off after the, the, the Regency, he seemed to totally disappear and there was stuff going on on one of the internet sites about he's defected and refusing to answer calls and all of that. That didn't ultimately prove to be true because his name started popping up again uh, when Imre Arrakis um, landed in the country, mm-hmm. um, you know, after being hired by Daniel Kinnahan to, to, to kill Patsy Hutch and Mago Gately. Mm-hmm. Um, Ross Browning's name was appearing as possibly having met, met him, uh, possibly having been involved in setting things up. So at that stage, he was back in the country and he was playing a role in 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 the, that operation again, the operation of, of what was really the, the 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 last really trusted guys of the Kenyan cartel. And his connections with the flashy stroke Gucci mob would have been he was the middleman between them and their suppliers, their overlords, who would have been the Kinahan organization then based in Dubai. Yeah. And I mean, they, they, you know, those thing, those connections were very well established. He was particularly uh, relying on a, a, another man that, that, that he has a long term connection with to, 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 you know, manage the, the, the flashy gang. And obviously then this, it's kind of like that franchise system where he would, he would direct that. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, uh, Trevor Byrne as well was playing a key role in that until he fled the country. Ultimately, he was returned to Ireland and is serving a long time in, 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 in prison for uh, like, gun offences. Browning is always very near to that, those hitmen, you know, yeah. and, and maybe bring them in, recruiting them. And um, again, it, it is just so at odds with a Zen lifestyle and that whole idea of, you know, finding peace and serenity around. Yeah, and he remained so trusted by Daniel Kinnan. He was obviously, there was the, the famous wedding in, in can you pronounce it? Because I can't. Burj Al Arab. Burj Al Arab. Have you not pronounced that? I don't know. I just, uh, I just can't. But, um, but. Uh, again? No, you did okay, actually. I did okay. But I, Burj Al Arab. Burj Al Arab. Yeah. There Very go. good. There you go. He was but, uh, at that wedding, yeah, in 2017. That, I only noticed that when we were. Yeah, and we I mean, there on. weren't, that was actually said in the cab, the cab mm. case. So like there weren't, they weren't inviting everybody over to no. that. No. By a long way. But he was um, very much back in the game. You see, I think what happened was that as the feud, like over the first 18 months into the two years of the feud, the Kinhans lost so many operatives on the ground. It was incredible. I mean, they lost an entire, um, you know, layer of middle management, yeah. all jailed, all caught up. And and actually, ultimately, that Imre Arrakis attempted hit on Mago Gately was the worst yeah. casualties for them because both Bomber Kavna and Daniel Kinahan put their own top men into that in, in an effort not to be caught because they thought that it was all so leaky in Dublin that, you know, unless they had really trusted soldiers there preparing for that hit that they would have been caught again. And sure enough, yeah, you know, out of their control, a separate investigation on Imre Arrakis, the hitman himself, centred in Lithuania, came back to bite them on that and they lost that whole layer of, of people, um, including other associates of Browning's from the Hardwick Street Flats area, yeah. um, Douglas Glynn in particular. But Browning kind of like while he was always important, I think he then became the main man for the Kinahans in Ireland. And and up until now, that's yeah. what we know. I mean, that's what was ruled by the, the, the judge um, uh, in the Criminal Assets Bureau case. Not only that he had used um, his family to try and hide the, uh, the proceeds of crime, but also that he was the Kinahans number one man here in, the, in in Ireland. Yeah, that's how he was described. And 
you have to remember as well, if you look at that top layer of the, the Kenyan organization, is he the last man that's not facing charges or potentially facing charges that can move in and out of Ireland? I mean, he's obviously been a target of, of CAB, but... In, in but is he not wanted in Spain after Operation Shovel? There was one... Do you remember Operation Shovel was such a bloody disaster and they initially started investigating them for, you know, organised crime and then they dropped that and they started investigating them for money laundering and then they dropped that. And what came at the very, very end of it was a charge for Yasvinder Singh Kamu, who was an old time um, money, man. money man for yeah. Kinahan Senior, uh, that he had driven a Mercedes with the wrong reg on it or something like this. There was something for Christy Kinahan to do with passport fraud yeah. and there was something for Ross Browning to do with passport. Well, I think that might have been dealt with ultimately. Um, but I'm, I'll have While he was out of the country. Yeah. So it's, I mean, that's, that's dead in the water then. Well, as far as I know. Yeah. And he is literally, certainly as far as I know, there's no files of the DPP for him here unless, which is often the case, um, the Guardi decide to use the, the criminal money laundering charges yeah. against, um, against an individual, in particular somebody who has sort of a non-disputed case with the Criminal Assets Bureau. Um, and and the evidence that that has gathered. So I mean, but as far as we know, I mean, there's obviously in a, for a criminal charge to do money laundering to be a higher burden of proof than in in, mm -hmm. in in the criminal assets bureau case where it's about the balance of probabilities. The money laundering in a criminal case will be beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, but at the moment, like there's been various reports of Ross Browning being back in the country, or certainly has been back in the country in recent times. Um, he hasn't been in photographed or anything like that. Um, you know, he had meant to have been visiting a sick relative at one stage. So he probably does remain the one person that could be trusted and that can move in and out of the country. Mm. Um, and like, really, there's nobody else. He's certainly a family man. I mean, that's the one thing that stands out for me about him. While we don't know, you know, a massive amount about any of these guys, we're kind of looking from the outside in. Um he seems to be a very, very solid family guy. And of course, he's been so close to his mother all the years along. Now, Julie Conway, at some point in her life, began a relationship with a Garda yeah. uh, by the name of uh, Dave O'Brien. Yeah. And Dave O'Brien was a detective Garda serving in the, dr the um, serious crime review team. Yeah. He was working there. I think he was in it from possibly the beginning. There was, you know, there was about eight guards that yeah. were handpicked. Better that known as the, the, the cold case unit. Sorry, the cold case unit. Yeah. People would know it more as, yeah. yeah. But uh, Christy Mangan, um, who will be coming on the show over the coming weeks because he has a new book out. Um, he's now retired. He was the in charge of that unit. And uh, there was certainly no more than eight detectives underneath them who were working on these cold cases. And Dave O'Brien was one of them. But this peculiar situation arose within that uh, unit some years ago. And it was to do with one of the other detectives receiving a Valentine's card to his place of work. Yeah. And in it was a thong, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, a bullet. Yeah. And an investigation ensued. I think GSOC, the, the Garda Shikona Ombudsman Commission, uh, handled it yeah. because there had been complaints made by the other detective that it was one of his fellow officers who had kind of carried out this frightening prank. Yeah. Um, and the focus went on Dave O'Brien. And at that point, his relationship with Julie Conway emerged because when the Garda Shikona Ombudsman Commission, committee, commission? Commission, commission, yeah. Was investigating. Um, they had access to his phones and they were able to see that there was like a phenomenal amount of texting and communication between them. Yeah. Um, now, that was a shock. Yeah. To people. Um, undoubtedly, that was a shock to people who worked with with Dave O'Brien. And I understand his his own wife and family were deeply sort of taken aback yeah. that he was mixing in those circles. And while Julie Conway has no uh, such connections to organised crime, we know that she was living off the proceeds. Yes, yeah, she's obviously um, a named respondent. She's a named, named respondent, exactly. 
and uh, her son being as high up a uh, member of the, the uh, Kinahan cartel. He has been, his face has been all over the newspapers and uh, it's been there in the ether since 2010 when he was arrested as part of Operation Shovel. Um, but it was a undoubtedly a very strange situation. Now they, um, I'm not sure they denied the relationship, but they certainly didn't go public with it until a number of years ago they got married and they posted their wedding photographs on social media. Um, and obviously Dave O'Brien moved in with Julie Conway to a house and a, an estate ultimately owned by Ross Browning and paid for yeah. with Kinahan drug money. Yeah. I mean, extraordinary. It is extraordinary. Um, and I mean, that's the finding of the court. I mean, they did find that they, I think it found this this cottage, which is on the, the same property, I believe. Um, there was pictures of it uh, today. Um, that there was spent something like a third of a million, I think it was described, doing up this cottage, which looks kind of modest from from the outside, yeah. which would have been a, a way these things are done. Um, and obviously then you do have the... Uh, you know, that disconnect again, where you have people living in two worlds that he, that, that Dave O'Brien uh, gave evidence to court, I think, in terms of a written submission that, no, it wasn't funded by the proceeds of crime, that he had borrowed money off the guard of credit union. Yeah. You know? And we should say there was a court case, there was a district court case, uh, Julie Conway and uh, Dave O'Brien were charged in relation to that offence, um, with the bullet and the Valentine's card and on appeal, I think his conviction was quashed. Yeah. Which he uh, he had to write and tell us about yeah. the last time we met. So just to make sure that we get it right this time. So he doesn't have a conviction in relation to that, but nonetheless was investigated. Um, but, it, you know, for me, um, Ross Browning is an incredibly interesting character in the whole story and the tapestry of the Kinahan organisation. I think... Dave O'Brien's sort of insertion into his world yeah. is is makes it even more. Yeah, it's just so un, it's just so unusual. I mean, but you you see there now where where is there to go for us Browning at this point? Um, yeah, and where is he? Like, I mean, do they go back to Hardwick Street flats because the family do still have uh, residences in those flats, which were I could never totally understand. Where is Dublin Corporation in all of this stuff? Dublin City Council, it's called now, of course, for the last 20 yeah, years, probably. Yeah. But um, yeah, where is it? Because we know of so many people that are living, for example, in Spain on the Costa del Sol in huge big villas. Um, sometimes they also are in and out of Dubai. And yet they have use of Dublin City Council accommodation yeah. it, with the homeless crisis as it is. Yeah. Um, all over this city, there are people who are. Yeah, I mean, look. Again, and like even criminal assets bureau case like this, like wh where is Dublin City Council with it? Yeah, I, d I mean, I don't know in this case in particular. I mean, obviously, people have the right then to to maintain the property after the say their their, their parents die and that's their home and that's where they the part of the community. That's a general sort of principle and a, a right that people have. In this case, I don't know, but it does seem that there should be a a way to look into the look into these things. Um, that, that I know of, for example, right, this yeah. particular individual who um, would be living off the proceeds of crime from a, the son. Okay. Yeah. And this individual has a very much sought after property paid for by Dublin City Council, it would be. It's either Dublin City or South Dublin, but it's one of the councils anyway. Um, a home where people would be queuing up. I mean, you just literally wouldn't get this area. Yeah. And uh, this woman lives most of the year in Portugal and she uses this home provided to her by the state just to stay in when she's home for the weekend. Yeah. I know of that situation. Yeah. And... I have actually sent that onwards and nothing has happened. No. About it. You know, I, I have, I know of plenty of other situations that there are, there doesn't seem to be any place to properly report these things. Um, while 
the Criminal Assets Bureau will work with the councils as well as everybody else that they work with. They cannot direct them. I mean, we know for a fact that the Criminal Assets Bureau in recent times raided a property in Oliver Bond, which was once the home of the Kinahan brothers and um, their mother. And they raided that property and they passed over any investigation to Dublin City Council and the mother died, shall we say, in 2014 and the property remains um, within. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's a complicated thing. Of course, in recent years, the Criminal Assets Bureau started going after social welfare payments in general. I mean, mm. they didn't used to do that, but that became a big source of you know, of a, a way to target people that if they had all mm. this wealth, this unexplained wealth, you know, and they're living clearly off that wealth, why were they also getting social welfare? So that became a real, a real aspect that they went after. Um, you know, not saying it's solely for nuisance value because there's obviously finances there, but there, there was a point made. I mean, I don't know what Dublin City Council can access in terms of information mm. or is there a problem sharing this stuff across or people have rights as well, you know, mm. uh, but it is an interesting, an interesting phenomenon. We should maybe invite them on and see what they have to say about <laughs> it. Should, yeah. I wouldn't uh, identify a couple of, uh, I wouldn't count on it. Uh, no, either would I. Anyway, if anybody has any information along those lines of any properties, state properties that are being, you know, being used by people who are living out of the jurisdiction and really coming back and not paying for a hotel, because um, it really irritates me. But anyway, there you go. So the the Ross Browning and uh, other members of who've been named as respondents, no doubt, will be able to fall back on. Yeah, and, um, and where they've traditionally lived in Hardwick Street. Yeah, and the property may be up on Daft in a few months if you wanna. Mm. If you wanna. If I want to buy Garristown. <laughs> if you want to buy Garristown, yeah. Yeah, with this with the the the. Proceeds of your next book. The proceeds. <laughs> With the honest proceeds of crime. Yeah. Right. Well, look, that's Ross Browning. So we'll, um, you know, and obviously if anybody uh, as well out there has any information for us that might be of interest to other investigations we're doing into Browning and other members of the cartel, please do contact us. Um, so, yeah, well, should we leave it at that for today? Thanks, Niall. Thanks, Nicola.